That's okay. You don't have to know the dalil, the evidence of Imam al-Shafi'i or Abu Hanifa or Malik in the way you pray. It's, it's okay for that. But when it comes to faith, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you must actually believe based on conviction, based on knowledge, not just because we are following others. So uh, why, are, why are Muslims today? I'm sure this question perhaps came to every one of us at a certain point of our life. Why am I Muslim today? Am I Muslim today because I was born to a Muslim family? Or did, did we make a choice? We know our brothers and sisters who convert to Islam, they made a choice. Sometimes it's a very difficult choice. And I really salute them for that. But for those who are born in Islam, um, do we ask ourselves this question? Why are Muslims today? And people ask us, what, what makes you sure that Islam is the right religion? What makes you sure that Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What makes you sure that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And interestingly, Islam is unlike other traditions that say that just you know, close your eyes and follow me. You don't have to think. Many other traditions, we know that, they discourage their followers to ask intellectual questions. The opposite of this, Islam tells us that we have to ask questions. We cannot believe simply because we are going with the crowd. We have to believe based on thinking, studying, observing. Doubt is necessary sometimes to reach faith and belief. As some said, yaqeen or faith comes as a result of doubt. When someone invites you to something, you have to think about it. You have to have some doubt until all doubts are gone, then this is what we call faith and belief. Now, why do we believe? Again, there is passionate belief and rational belief. We need actually in this day and time and, and place we are living in, we have to really think or rethink about our faith and our iman. Especially when we live in a time that is full of misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. Okay, so they asked me to stop for a while. Okay, so many questions, tough, difficult questions, come to us. And most of us are not equipped to answer these questions and to engage with the community with, uh, with, with a rational discussion. So therefore, I believe that we as Muslims, we need to read more and we need to rationalize everything we read. So talking about Rasulullah this is just one uh, example that I just want to ask about. I will ask you now, think about it. If someone comes today and claims a prophet, someone says that I'm the messenger of God, God has sent me to you. Okay? What would you ask him to prove that he's a prophet? How do we know he's a, a liar or a prophet? Imagine if you were alive at the time of Rasulullah in Mecca in the 7th century. You belong to a family and a tribe. You worship idols. You practice, you know, the uh, tradition or, or the uh, uh, custom, customary practice there. And here is someone coming to make us such a big claim that I am the messenger of God. God has chosen me to guide you. People have every right to question his claim, right? So what would you do if you were alive then? What would you do? What do you want to see? What kind of proof do you want to see from this person? I just thought about this. I thought about this because it's very difficult for people to abandon their tradition and to change their lifestyle. Very difficult. One of the most difficult things to convince people that they are wrong and to change their customs. Very difficult. But here comes Muhammad وسلم, making such claim that I am the messenger of God. I would suggest, I thought about this, that I would see the personality, his personality, his akhlaq, his action, and whether he is personally benefiting from this message or not. Then I will look at the content of the message itself. So I'll look at the messenger and the message that he's preaching. What kind of message is this? Now, looking at, at the Prophet's akhlaq, even before he received the wahi, he was known as as-Sadiq al-Amin. Not once 
the enemies of Islam or those who rejected the Prophet وسلم, claim that he lied once, once in his lifetime, or cheated once, or had any um, shameful, immoral activities. Not once. Nobody. They told he's a liar, they said he's a, a poet, but no one said وسلم, lied to us in this particular time, this particular instance, or he cheated, or he made any Cry. His record was so clean, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's a, a very important, to be honest. Cannot imagine a prophet who is dishonest, right? That's why he's known as al-Ameen, the honest, the truthful, the trustworthy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This one important thing that we need to look at. People, when they use, when they look for someone who is trustworthy to leave their uh, trust, because they want to travel, they keep it with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he is known as Al-Ameen. Did he benefit from the message sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Did he benefit from his message? In fact, the opposite is true. If you look at the lifestyle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before Islam, his income, or what kind of life that he used to live before Islam, and after you see a dramatic change. And this is what the disbelievers observed. They said, Shaqiya Muhammad ibn Rabbi. Or this religion, this God of Muhammad made his life miserable. Before Islam, Rasulullah sallam, you know, we all know that he was married to, was married to Khadija, radiallahu anha, a very wealthy woman. He's running her business. Very good living, very good income, very comfortable life. They have their own house, they have nice furniture, they have business. They have four beautiful children, girls. He has been having a very decent life. You cannot ask for any more. Khadija has come from a very um, a noble family. He's come from the best family in Quraysh. Everybody loves him. He has no enemies whatsoever. That's a comfortable life. But Rasulullah was not comfortable because he knew this something that he's looking for. He's not happy with the tradition of his people, worshipping idols, drinking alcohol, and doing all these, uh, and of course, literally. Those who are master and slaves, very wealthy and very poor. No equality between men and women, Arabs and non-Arabs, white and black. All these things he did not like. But he does not know what to do exactly. This is the meaning of Dalman here means that he doesn't know what to do. You, you don't like what's happening, but you don't have a particular plan to change this situation. So what happened when the Quran came to him, to him? From the very first moment, he came, we all know the story, to Khadija radiallahu anha, and he was shaking, and he saw him cover me. He was shivering. And then soon after, Khadija noticed that he does not sleep, so the Dr. Christ is making da'wah and praying so much. And she told him, why don't you just get some, some, some sleep? And he told her that the time for sleeping has passed. In other words, from now on, there's no time to sleep. Either worship Allah or invite people to Islam. His life from this moment was a life of struggle. Jihad, as we say. For the rest of his life, all his career as a as the Prophet in his entire life was full of struggle. Things changed. Now he has a lot of enemies. He has to pray most of the night and give most of his money and face a lot of challenges. So in fact, Rasulullah did not, was not poor and he became wealthy after Islam. So Islam did not give him extra money and extra um, uh, uh, prestige per se. Rather, he spent 10, 13 years in Mecca, full of challenges, persecution, and killing his companions, and even attempts to kill him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We all know that there are so many people are, who are taking uh, religion as business. Religion is, has been, in the past and still, is a huge business. All this mega church and, and all these um, kings and emperors who also play religion, or uh, used religion uh, for their um, political gain. Mega church. 
in the name of God, you buy stuff and make those who are um, preaching this as wealthy people. But Muhammad وسلم, did not preach to make himself wealthy. He was already wealthy. Muhammad وسلم, did not, was not looking for enemies. Everybody loved him. But now everybody you know, starts giving him names. What also I would look at is the message itself. Look at the message itself. I personally have no doubt Muhammad is Rasulullah Because I, I examined all these things. And the, when we study the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, every page of his seerah وسلم, tells us clearly that he is the truthful. The truthful leader, the Rasulullah Wasallam. Rasulullah's message is also worthy of thinking. What is in the heart of the Islamic message? What is the most essential part of Islam? Anybody? Huh? Tawheed, exactly. Everything in Islam is built around this word, La ilaha illallah. If you just look at the, this, this principle of Tawheedullah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how difficult it was to convince people who have, we used to worship multiple idols, that all these idols are false, there's only one God. If you look at the of the life of Isa alayhi salam, just a very quick comparison. Isa alayhi salam was sent to who? To Bani Israel, right? Did he have any problem preaching people that there's only one God? No. Isa alayhi salam had no issue with that ilaha illallah because he came to people who believe in that ilaha illallah, the Jews. The Jews know Allah is one God. So all that the struggle the Prophet sallam went through to convince people there's only one God that was behind Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam was focusing on bringing people back to the message of Musa alayhi salam. Right? It was a challenge as well, but compared to the challenge of the Prophet sallam was very difficult. It was very difficult. And if Rasulullah sallam was a false prophet, he wouldn't have taken such very difficult way. He would have chosen something else. Maybe you could focus on, on equality, perhaps. And many um, second-class citizens, slaves, poor people, women, they would have followed him. People would loved his preaching. That would be an easy um, thing to sell to the people of Quraysh. But he, alayhi salatu wasalam, had no choice. Because he's Rasulullah, he does what Allah tells him to do. So, la ilaha illallah was the biggest challenge in the Prophet's life. We also know the story when they, the leaders of Quraysh came to him and they told him, listen, if this is all about money, we'll make you the wealthiest one. We'll collect money and we'll make you the wealthiest one of us. Don't worry about this, but just forget about this la ilaha illallah thing. If it's all about leadership, we will appoint you as our king. Realize you as our leader. What else? And he, sallallahu alayhi wa said that I don't need any of these things. I just want you to say one word. Who would refuse all these things for a word? He said, what kind of word this? He said, just one word, that is la ilaha illallah. No, I cannot give you this. I cannot give you this. We can give you anything, but I cannot give you this. Because la ilaha illallah means that there's only one God. And there's one guidance. Only one who makes laws. Everybody should follow. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his messenger. But because they want to play God, they want to, you know, they don't, they like the status quo, they don't want to change the systems that they built. They no, we cannot give you this. Because I have many gods and we cannot change that. So the message of Tawheed shows clearly that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. If you look at any encyclopedia, any dictionary about the monotheistic faith, everybody knows that those who are Muslims and non-Muslims, that monotheistic faith are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was known as a person who is teaching there's only one God. No one has any dispute on this. That in the heart of his message was La ilaha illallah. Very difficult. The change, very difficult to sell to the people back then, but that's the only way. This is what Allah told him. There's no compromise in this area. That was very clear, that there's only one God. Second, we all know that Muhammad was illiterate. And Nabi al-Ummi, Quran says that. 
الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الامي الامي means illiterate person the person cannot write and read now we know also that in Arabia there was there were no libraries schools colleges philosophers in this area perhaps in in, in Byzantine Empire Persian ancient Greek but in Arabia, Muhammad Sallallahu did not go to any school. He does not know how to write. He does not even know how to read his own name. He never wrote his name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran says that a great evidence that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of God. The Quran says clearly, You have never read a book before this book, Quran. وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِ You never wrote anything with your right hand. إِذَا لَرْتَابَ الْمُسْلُونَ If Muhammad Sallallahu was able to read, and he read hundreds and thousands of books, and wrote many articles and books and poetry, and all of a sudden he said, I'm the messenger people that said, yeah, you know, he's a philosopher, has a lot of ideas, he wrote so many books, that have been influenced by all these books he read. But not once Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was able to read a word, or write a word. And so Hudaybiyah, when they wrote the agreement, I said from Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, uh, between, this agreement between Muhammad, Rasulullah, and Suhail ibn Am, representing Quraysh. Quraysh said, no, we don't re realize you as Rasulullah. So erase it. Erase Muhammad, Rasulullah. Say just Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ali ibn Abdullah said, no, I'm not going to erase it. It's Ali who's writing it. And the Prophet Hassan told him, where, where is it? He said, this is the one, your name is here. And he saw Salam, Scratched it. That tells you that he doesn't even read his name. In other words, there's no source of this huge knowledge except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know now in universities we have departments political science, chemistry, biology, law, philosophy, and so on and so forth. One can be um, a PhD in philosophy, and then becomes a great professor and Write you know, multiple books in, in the field. Then he's an expert in philosophy or an expert in law or literature. But Muhammad Sallallahu message was a comprehensive message. These are the two important qualities of Al Islam. One is comprehensiveness, the other is universality. Someone never been in any school, does not know how to write and read, has no teachers. By the way, when we talk about our great scholars, Abu Hanifa, for example, so who, who are the teachers of Abu Hanifa and the students of Abu Hanifa? The teachers of Imam Shafi'i and the students of Imam Shafi'i. The teachers of Abu Bukhari and the students of Abu Bukhari, right? Who are the teachers of Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anybody know? There's no teachers. There's no teachers. And he's someone in the seventh century, illiterate, coming from Arabia. Teaching the entire world how to live their life, every details of their life, a comprehensive message that gives you a complete world view, how to live an ethical life here and how to prepare yourself for the eternal life after death. How to be an ethical politician, how to be an ethical judge, how to be an ethical Commander-in-Chief, how to be an ethical judge, how to be an ethical teacher, how to be an ethical father, how to live an ethical life in all aspects of life. And for those of you who study Islamic law, you can see how the Hadith of Quran talked about every details of human activities. All these rules and regulations, do's and don'ts, based on ethical structure, very clear ethical structure. How could someone, never been in a school, had no teachers to be the teacher of the world? And claims also that his message is not only for Quraysh, it's not only for Arabs, it is the final message to the entire humanity, to the Day of Judgment. Not only in his time, but this is the message for, from Allah to the entire humanity, to the Day of Judgment. And the first page in his book, a tribute to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي This is the book, there's no doubt in it. وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْبِ اللَّهِ لَا وَجَدُ فِي اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Don't they reflect, don't they think about the Qur'an? If it was not from Allah, they would have found plenty of contradictions. And alhamdulillah, until today, no contradictions. Now, people always 
think about or ask about the miracles of the Prophet Every Prophet, as we know, came up with some miracles to prove that he's a Prophet. And people ask Rasulullah for the same thing. That's a very legitimate request. Someone making such a big claim proves to us all Prophets came with miracles, physical miracles. We all know the miracles of Musa السلام, that his staff turned to a snake and he puts his hand under his arm and then it starts shining like this bulbs here, comes, you know, womanating. And uh, we all know that the uh, Nile River turned to blood and the frogs and, and floods and all these things. And those who were there, Quran told us about this um, game between uh, Musa السلام, and the magicians. Those who saw these miracles, the magicians themselves, were the first people to believe in Musa السلام, because they knew that's not magic, it's real. This is a real snake, not just they thought or they saw it as a snake. Right? And Isa السلام, Quran talked in many places about the miracles he practiced by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep in mind, prophets don't have this inherent nature of turning things or making miracles. It's Allah who allowed them to practice these miracles to prove that they are prophets. They do things that no one else can do. And so when they claim that the prophets of Allah, then they have, they have proved it. But keep in mind, all these miracles, Isa alayhi salam, we know that he, he gave life to a dead person. Isa alayhi salam um, healed by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the leper and the blind. And he told people what they have, what, what kind of food they have in their homes. He made um, from clay the shape of birds and he blew into them in the name of Allah and they became real birds. Why? People saw that with their own eyes. He was speaking when he was one week old. People saw these things. Ironically, many of them did not believe. Many of them, despite seeing all these physical miracles, did not believe. Some did. The reason why they did is because they saw something that only a prophet of Allah can do. So the physical miracles and they were timely, limited to the time. Only this generation saw Isa and saw the miracles that Isa practiced. But those who came after, they heard about it, right? They heard about it. But because Muhammad وسلم, was that final message, and his message is a universal message, this, his miracle must stay for generations to come. They have access to this miracle. They can see it, they can examine it, they can think about it. That is what we call Al-Qur'an Al-Qur'an Al -Quran Karim is not a physical miracle, it is an intellectual miracle. And we have to be proud of this. We Muslims, as I said in the very beginning, that Islam is a rational religion. Because the miracle of, of Rasulullah was Al-Qur'an. Still authentic. No one can add or delete anything from it. And read it. And Quran challenged people's mind. Don't they think? Don't they read? And when his people ask him that, why don't you let your Lord make rivers in Mecca? Because of course in Mecca is a water issue. No rivers near Mecca. Or let him make for you gardens. Or let him push these mountains that surround Mecca, let him push it, make it a big valley so that we can move freely. Or ask your Lord to bring an angel that you can see coming from the heaven, holding the book, saying that this is the book of God and Muhammad is the messenger. Then we will believe in you. And Rasulullah said, قُلْ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّ هَلْ كُنْتُ إِلَّا بَشْرًا رَسُولًا Tell them, SubhanAllah. This miracle, is, if Allah wants this to happen, He will make it happen, but don't ask me because I'm a human being. I cannot do these things. Unless, until Allah allows me to do it. But when they kept asking him for these things to happen, what did Allah say? In Surah Al-Ankabut, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِ It's not enough that we have revealed this book that they can read. They can find out that this book in itself is a miracle. 
So for us as Muslims, we, we need to really think of Al-Quran as a book that we proudly read, memorize, understand, and that's the Burhan that Allah has sent to all mankind. No other religious book as, as authentic as Al-Quran al -Karim. Even the Christians and Jews themselves never say that the Bible is 100% authentic. No one says that. You know that 300 years after Isa alayhi salam. No one can say this is the book written by Isa. It's all inspiration to uh, apostles. And they wrote it down. That multiple different Bibles translated to many different languages. Big differences between them. But for the book of Islam is a book of guidance that says clearly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if they think it is Muhammad who wrote this book, let them produce Quran like it. Nobody could. And the challenge went down to 10 surahs only, only 10 surahs. Nobody could. And the challenge went all the way down to one chapter, one surah. He could not. So how could someone in the seventh century, never been in his school, had no degree, that challenged the entire world, all humanity, and jinn. Said if jinn and human come together to assist each other to produce even one surah like this, you will not be able to do that. They will not be able to do that. And some tried, some tried, but they produced something that really shows the exact opposite of what they want to prove. That shows clearly that this Quran is the word of Allah. Because when Allah speaks, it's different from people speaking. Quran is the word of Allah, we can see this in everything that says. When someone came to Rasulullah Sallallahu and asked him, what is Islam? He recited one ayah, Surah al -Nahl. We recite in Ramadan, other than Ramadan. But we just read it, we just run quickly. We don't read it, we give any thought about it. Surah al -Nahl, Allah says, In Allah al abdi wal ihsan wa ita'i dil qurba wa anha an al-fahshai wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tadakkaru. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders al abd justice, al ihsan good conduct, wa ita'i dil qurba to help your relatives. وَيَنْهَا and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits عن الفحشاء shameful immorality والمنكر bad conduct والبغي injustice that's Islam Islam is an ethical message everything Islam has to do we can connect anything in Islam to our faith our belief in Allah and the Islamic ethics all halal and haram in Islam has ethical dimension Everything that's harmful, that's haram. Every, anything that's useful, it's made either wajib or recommended. All our ulama came up with these five categories. Either prohibited, or detested, disliked, or permissible, or recommended, or wajib. Any act, any act, any human act should be under one of these five categories. Depends on how useful or harmful the act is. Consumption of alcohol, we know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's some benefit, but the harm is much greater. Therefore, it is strictly prohibited. Why would Muhammad sallallahu think of this? Drinking alcohol was part of the social norm then. Why did Muhammad let it go? People drink in all cultures. Muhammad does not make laws. He received the law from Allah and conveyed it to people. Allah said there's some benefit in gambling and alcohol, but the harm is much greater. Another example that we can relate to in our life is interest or, or usury or riba. Why would Muhammad bother to make something, again, part and parcel of the economical system back then and almost everywhere, and he makes it strictly prohibited as unethical practice? That you give your loan with interest in of itself is unethical. I've seen this in 2008, 2009 here in America. How hardworking people, they lost everything. They lost their jobs, they lost their insurance, they lost their homes, and the banks mercilessly, they took their homes from them. Have no insurance, you cannot, you know, when you get sick, may Allah help you. We have seen this 
We have seen this injustice going on. Students want to get knowledge, get a degree, that, so that they can, they can make their living. They start their college life with loans and loans and loans. So once they graduate, their job is to work hard to pay off their loans with interest. And many people spend the, 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 their entire life trying to pay off their debts and cannot because interest grows. Non-stop. Why, why, why in, in, in any just and fair system, youth who want to get college education start their life with it? So you're supposed to graduate, start working, build a family, and live a happy life. No. We will own your time, your effort, your knowledge. It's ours. You have to work for us. You pay us first, and then you think about yourself and your family. Muhammad, if the world just today followed the teaching of Rasulullah wouldn't we'll have all this injustice. It takes some time for people to realize that Muhammad said in his farewell speech, he said all contracts that has riba in it, it is void and null. It's under my feet, he said. It's under my feet. Including, and the first contract is the contract of my uncle Abbas. But Muhammad needed money to build his community, it's true. So let you know, the usury you know, bring some revenue. No, this is dirty money. We don't need to build our community, our country, our system with dirty money. So Muhammad وسلم, his message is, of course, a tawheed, the first thing, it's a universal message, and, and a comprehensive message, and a message that based on al-akhlaq, ethics. We don't compromise with these ethical things. And among this, also what we suffer from in this country, discrimination, racism, white versus black, wealthy versus poor. This is a, the real American problem. It's, it's just, you know, America suffered from the very beginning. This idea of supremacy. Why is supremacy? You're a male, white, Christian. Then, then you are the most privileged. But others are considered subhuman, second class, low class, all these terminology they came up with. And I like what uh, Imam Dawood Walid said in the presentation last Thursday, OU, when he talked about Islam and American politics. He said, by the way, the idea of white supremacy, because they said there's no white supremacy. The idea or the claim of white supremacy, every time you mention this word, he said, the idea of white supremacy and so on, because he said there's no white supremacy. It's a real problem. Racism is a real problem in human life, in all cultures, in all cultures. But how did Muhammad deal with this? How did he deal with this? It was very odd for Muhammad to tell the people that, especially the elites of Quraysh, Utbah and Bilal, the black Abyssinian slave, are equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very difficult to sell this. Men and women are equal. They are partners. And nisa or shaqa'i or rijal. Women are partners of men. No supremacy. Particular gender or color or race or ethnicity or others. Illa bi taqwa. Illa bi taqwa. Inna karamakum inda Allah. The most honored one of you in the eyes of Allah are those who have taqwa. So Rasulullah sallallahu all, and all these things that are proof very clearly, very clearly, that Muhammad can both, cannot be a liar or a false prophet. He is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa ashabihi ajma'i. I got, I know that, I have to uh, end now. So uh, with this, I will uh, end. And inshallah, Dr. Ramzi will also um, perhaps address the same subject from different scientific perspective. So uh, again, Jazakallah khair. See you after Shah, inshallah. Salaam alaykum.
Can you talk a bit? Yeah, uh, our dear brother right here is talking about one of the challenges we have here not, is not polytheism, but rather atheism. That uh, some uh, Muslims are agnostic, they are not sure uh, if God is there, uh, or those who um, um, confer that there's no God at all. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, I, I am very much aware of this. And um, that's why I said it's one of the good reasons why we have to un understand our religion rationally and logically, not only passionately um, or emotionally. If you are growing up in a Muslim country, there's no issue, or there's no need to study this. But now, how to prove that God is there? How do we know there's God? Of course, this will take so long to talk about. Perhaps Dr. Ramsey will get the, uh, more time and chance to address this. but. We, we, we as, as, as adults, as parents, as teachers, we actually need to rethink how we introduce Islam to our youth and to study Islam ourselves, right? We have been accused of doing exactly what Christians did. Don't think. We discourage our youth from asking tough and difficult questions. And when we shut them down, this actually raises more doubt, right? But if you are open about, what if someone comes to you as a, as a parent and says, I'm not sure Allah exists. What would we do? Start from Allah, you know, say, A'udhu Billah, the Shaitan Rajeem, and, 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 and say this dick a hundred times, and these bad thoughts will go away from me. It's not going to go anywhere. Because this is what we hear at school, in college, everywhere. Right? So, I know the word philosophy is a kind of a dirty word. Muslims don't like to use the word philosophy because philosophy, but by nature, Allah is of course, very deep. I cannot cover it in two minutes. But um, I, I strongly believe that we have to read our own Quran and understand it. Uh, read the life of the Prophet وسلم, rationally and, and understand it. Um, instead of just indoctrinate for our youth what to, to say, what to, what to believe. If we don't really read our own Quran and understand the tafsir of it and the context in which it was revealed and what, how can we implement it in our life now, then Quran will just become a book of blessings. <coughs> we focus so much on how to do khatm al-Quran Ramadan, how to read Quran as fast as possible and make dua khatm al-Quran, and that's it. Our benefit uh, or benefiting from Quran is so limited, uh, unfortunately. I, I am not only this community. We benefit very little from the Quran. Quran was sung as, as, as proof. Allah said, read it and you'll find the truth there. Do we read the Quran? We recite the Quran, but we don't really deeply understand the deep meaning of Quran. That's why all these halakas and study circles of tafsir of Quran and, and try to understand that value or the uh, rational group, uh, proofs in Islam uh, but it is, is there. We just need to really approach the Quran and read the Quran rationally. If the, more we, the, the deeper we read the Quran, the more we'll find plenty of treasure there. So, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our iman and our yaqeen. And the time for Isha now.